started attending Moody Bible Institute in Chicago in 1980. Uh, the, I was in the, the concert band there. There's five, 50 or 60 of us in the concert band. And one of the gals in the band uh, named Holly, for whatever reason, Holly became enamored with me. Uh, Holly was a, a character. I couldn't uh, really figure out if she was just kind of playing with me or not. But, but Holly would, would uh, stop me in the hall or call me in the middle of the night, or leave me a message uh, that, that basically was letting me know her schedule in case I wanted to invite her out to let them eat cake. It was this real classy bakery on Rush Street. Holly loved cake. And so all the time I was getting calls and messages and cornered, you know, when are you going to ask me out to let them eat cake? And I, Well, one night uh, I remember she called me, so studying, and I got a call from Holly letting me know that she was available Friday night just in case I wanted to invite her out to let them eat cake. Well, I was getting, you know, tired of this in all honesty. It was, it was kind of rubbing me the wrong way. And, uh, you know, I let her know that I had plans for Friday night. That wasn't going to work out. And just as we're getting ready to, to hang up, I asked if I could talk to her roomie. I knew Debbie uh, well. Debbie was in the band as, as well. Cute little godly southern girl. And uh, so Debbie got on the phone. Uh, hi, Deb. How are you? Oh, hi, Mark. Deb, are you doing anything Friday night? She says, no, I think I'm open. Great. Would you like to go to Let Them Eat Cake? She said, oh, sure. You know, we, we hung up. I just thought this was, this was hilarious. This was wonderful. I just thought this was fantastic. Uh, she must have told Holly, and then she went on to the library because she called me a couple hours later and let me know that uh, when she got back to her room, Holly had taken all of her clothes and her bed and everything and kind of threw it out into the hallway and closed the door and locked her, locked her out. Again, I just thought this was just, just hilarious, right? Well, it was a couple days later. It wasn't quite Friday yet, and uh, I was in the tunnels at Moody. Moody, uh, many of the buildings are connected underground with a series of tunnels, so you never have to go out, outside. And uh, it was, must have been after dinner, and for whatever reason, I'm like the only one in this long, long, long tunnel, and I'm walking back towards the dorm. And all of a sudden, at far end of the tunnel, someone walks out. And they start walking towards me. I realize it's Debbie. It's like, oh, Debbie. So we get close to each other. Debbie, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Debbie, I'm really looking forward to our date Friday night. She says, yeah, um, I need to talk to you about that. And I said, yes. She said, I, I, I need to cancel our date Friday. I said, really? She said, yeah, I think... You only invited me out to get back at my roommate, and I think I'm just worth a little more than that. And then, then it just gets worse. She, believe it or not, she says, you, 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 know, you know, Mark, your reputation, I don't know if you know what they think about you, but, but you, you flirt with girls and make them think that you're interested in them. And so when they respond you then shut them down it's almost like a game you play with the hearts of girls i just thought you'd want to know that and i'm st you know i'm about this tall you know egg on my face feet in my mouth whatever analogy you want to use for feeling like scum that's me right there at that point in history i'm watching debbie turn and walk out of the hallway or that tunnel and then i turn and go back to the the, the dorm and you need to know, when I, when I got out of that tunnel, I was different than how I came in. I didn't know I was doing, I did, what dysfunction, what, what, what insecurity, what, what uh, sinful, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't know. I was totally blind to this. But when she shared it, I thought, that's right, that's right. Uh, if she wouldn't have shared that, with me, what? A, I wish I could tell you from that point on, no one ever had to rebuke me. Yeah, that's really not the case. But Debbie did get me going on the right direction, at least in this area. I, I, I wonder. I wonder. I wonder about this. Is it just possible that I've got other things inside me, even today, that I'm blind to? I, I don't know. I've got this dysfunction, this this insecurity, this issue, but it's affecting my family. 
or my relationships or even my walk with God, the, the church. I'm guessing, you know what? I'm guessing I do. And I'm guessing you have some as well. And if you don't have somebody who's willing to put it on the table, you know what? We continue on in our dysfunction in our air. I think this is why Solomon, when he's talking to his son, and he's going to tell, tell his boy how, to, that's what the book of Proverbs is all about, how you're going to live wife, son. He's passing on wisdom. And he says, son, you need to know in this life, you will find people, some, some people who will be bold enough to rebuke you. And that's going to hurt. And your first, your first defense is to, to shoot back and to deny. And, and, and it, it's, it's to make excuses, but you can't go down that road. Because that will destroy you if you go down that road. So, so here you go, son. When those things happen and you get rebuked, you got to fight everything inside you. And you have to embrace the rebuke. The way Solomon is going to say it is Proverbs 27, verses 5 and 6. It says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Now, now this is our, our principle. Now, you, but let me tell you, before I give you our, our principle... I want you to look at this, and maybe you can get this in better, a better principle than I can, better, better phraseology. Okay, but this principle that I have for us is we need to embrace rebuke. Okay, I, I know there's nothing flashy about this. I'm, we're told in, in preaching class, you got to come up with that one memorable, classy, fun, bumper sticker type line that everyone's going to remember, right? So I was busting my head this week trying to think out, you know, things like uh, reproof is not aloof. Or, or correction is not infection. Or how about, this is my favorite one, rebuke is not puke. And, and my, 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 my family said, no, 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 you can't, this is not a youth retreat, you can't go down that road, rebuke is not puke. But I, 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 so we're not going down that road, it's embrace rebuke. But listen to this one for a second, because rebuke, Psalm is going to let us know, is is, is, is not a bad taste in our mouth. The re rebuke is, is nothing that we're supposed to try to avoid at all costs. Rebuke is, is nothing that is nauseating. Just, just the opposite if you see it through God's eyes. And so let's look at the, the, the verse again. 27, 5, and 6. Better is open rebuke. Make sure we're all on the same page. Rebuke is, is correction. It's somebody, this is why it, it can hurt sometimes, because it's somebody pointing out a character flaw, perhaps. I mean, it goes, that goes to the deepest part of your soul. A character flaw uh, that they're seeing, that they're disapproving of, that is, uh, maybe you didn't notice. Maybe it's hurting you. Maybe it's hurting your, your relationships. It's, it's, it's rebuke. It's, it's correction. Sometimes it's offered in Debbie style. Nice. Sometimes it's not offered in Debbie style. Nice. Either way, our responsibility is to embrace rebuke. Better, he says better is open rebuke. Open is just put on the table. Okay, It's not hidden. It's revealed. Not concealed. Revealed. It's said. It's manifested. He says better is open rebuke than hidden love. We all know. Every one of us have experienced this hidden love thing where we know we should say something, but we don't want to hurt them. And we're afraid how they might respond. And we're afraid they might fire at us and we're afraid it can hurt the relationship and so even though we love them and all we're just gonna be quiet that's what that's what the hidden love thing is and we've all been there and he says no no open rebuke is better than hidden love faithful are the wounds of a friend we know what wounds are it's bruises it's uh ouchy it's self it's, been, it's an inflicted pain that somebody has brought upon us but of a friend. It's an interesting word. Friend. A Hebrew word means one who loves. Now follow. follow uh, we mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Proverbs. You can't breeze by them. You got to camp on them. You got to focus. You got to dig deep. Uh, one who loves. One who loves. If he really loves. Will Wound you, right? But profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Enemy, just opposite, right? It's one who uh, is not committed to you, is not loyal to you. 
actually loves themselves more than you. They hope good things are going to happen to you, but really they're committed more to themselves. How they're going to look, how they're going to feel. So, so the kisses of an enemy, they're going to manifest. Oh, you're wonderful, you're great. I love the kisses. I mean, your enemy, your friend, oh, well, let me know how great I am. You know, just tell me how wonderful and how godly and I blow Andy Stanley away. I love it when people tell me those things. That's wonderful. I just, just keep peeping it on. The kisses of an enemy. But what does flattery do first? Proverbs 29. One. Look what he says here. A man who flatters his neighbor, 29.5, spreads a net for his feet. If you flatter your neighbor, kisses of the enemy. You know what it does to this person? It, it, it gives, puts them in a trap. It, it puts them in a situation. It sets them up to fail. That's why Solomon says that those kisses, flattery, oh, you're fine, you're wonderful, everything is good... It's going to destroy you. That's the things we like. We, want, we don't want friend club, right? We want a fan club. We don't want to hear things we need. We want to hear things we want to hear. And what that does, it just kind of enhances our little fantasy world about who we are. And Solomon says, don't, don't live in that world. Okay? You, you, you can break out with the thing that's going to get you out of it. It's going to be, it's going to be rebuke you know it, it's it's interesting this this is what god does look at look at proverbs 3 11 and 12 neat neat verses it says my son do not despise the lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof why because the lord reproves him whom he loves as a father the son in whom he delights well don't you know that's going to hurt why do you think the lord would reprove why he would rebuke the one he loves he wants them to grow. He knows what he's created them to be. And he knows you and I are chained to this garbage thinking, to stuff from the world, from our own sinful propensity to guard ourselves. We're, we're chained by that. We're controlled by that. And the way to break out is, is rebuke. So the Lord is going to... This is one of the purposes of the Bible. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for rebuke. He says, for correction, for training, it's, it's a whole thing is designed to, 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 to grow us. Now, n- notice, if you see this right, love rebukes. Love rebukes. If you fail to rebuke, uh, you're probably failing to love is, is the deal. Love rebukes. So what do we... What do we do, do with this? How do we, how do we respond? When, you, you know, when someone rebukes us. You know, this is interesting. I was uh, going, uh, I never desired to get a, a doctorate. I've got, got my doctorate, in case y'all didn't know, everyone should know this. Um, but I didn't want one. I didn't have time. I didn't care for the school. I'm not, not that. But there's this guy that you all probably haven't heard of, but he's a rock star in the preacher's world. His name is Haddon Robinson. He actually wrote a textbook that kind of set a new paradigm for preaching. It was used in hundreds and hundreds of Bible college and seminaries, even today. And, and it, I was trained on this. And so I remember at one point I wanted Haddon. He was the chair of the Department of Preaching at Dallas. And he was the president of Denver Theological Seminary. Then he was the uh, president at Gordon-Conwell and the, the chair of that preaching department. I thought, I'm going to send him a cassette tape. This is way back when. And maybe he'll listen to it and call me up. So I call his secretary at Gordon-Conwell and I say, will he do this for me? She said, no, he won't. But he'll mentor you instead. I thought, oh, this is great. So, so I, but the only way he does this is through this program, you know, of marketing, right? So I'm going to this. So I go to the, the program, first week of class, first day of class, myself and about 30 other guys, preacher guys. And for Haddon, for us, again, it's like just under the Apostle Paul. And so we're sitting there waiting, anticipating, and all of a sudden Haddon walks in. You know, we've read his books, we were, and we're like, oh. And he gets right in front of us, and he introduces himself. Haddon has a real rough voice. He was, uh, grew up in the Bronx. He had the New York accent type thing going on. And so he introduced himself. And then he said, he said uh, we're going to get to know each other. And, and I hope you like me. But frankly, I don't care. Because my job is to make you a better preacher. And that's going to hurt. And some days, 
It's going to hurt a lot. So all of us got a different text, right? And we had, to, we had to come up with a big, we had to study this text and we had to come up with a big idea and the outline and present it to the class and to Haddon. And, and this is the big idea. This is what the author meant in my text. I think it was in Isaiah. And so I, I nailed it though, man. I studied it. I was sure that this was the big idea of the text and this was the outline. And so I got up there to present it. I had the overhead thing going on and I put my, my outline on the overhead and I'm going, I'm waxing eloquent. I'm convincing all these guys that this is the right, this is the right outline. And Haddon, Middle of my presentation, he stands up and he comes walking towards me and he stands like right in front of the overhead and he's staring at the screen and he, he does one of these things. He's shaking his head, turns around, goes to something, going, oh no, oh no. And then, then he, he enters into, in a kind sort of way, he enters into a, 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 a rant of questions. Do you know? What the author Isaiah is saying in his whole book. Do you understand what he said up to this point and what he's going to be saying and how this is a transitional section? And do you understand that this one word that he only uses seven times in the book, he defines it the exact same way every time, except for the one way that you decided you're going to preach this thing. And do you understand that? And he keeps going on and on and on. I was destroyed. And you know what? He did, don't, he did that for everybody in the class, just so you know. Okay, We were all realized what losers we were as preachers before this class was done. <laughs> Fast forward years, developed a mentoring relationship with Haddon. Um, I still get together with a handful of guys we, every, every year who've been trained by him. None of us at that point would like him. Every one of us deeply loved this guy who, who changed our lives. Because, why, why? Because he cared enough to wound us. His job wasn't, I hope you like me, and I, that's what I'm going to live for. No, 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 no. no. I want you to be the best who God has created you to be. And I'm going to do whatever I have to do to help you get there. That's what friendship is, right? That's fr- now, now the, the problem with this, problem with, it, with this, this wounds of a friend thing, right, is sometimes what we can do is we can say, well, that's right. And we, friends, we will accept rebuke from. But see, all these other people rebuking me, they obviously are not friends, right? So I don't have to listen to their, their stuff. Hey, this is, don't, don't, go down, don't go down that road, okay? This is, it's like a second Samuel. Is that right? <laughs> this is, this is, this is, let me give you the background of this. This is, this is fantastic. Because not for David, he's not thinking that at the time. Uh, but David was king. He was king, king of Jerusalem. He was in charge. But his son Absalom stirred up a revolt, a coup. And he's chasing David. He's, he's going in. He's trying to kill David. David is sneaking out the back door of Jerusalem right now. Okay, He's heading out. He's trying to get out of the way. It says, when King David came to Baharim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul. Remember, Saul was the previous king. Kingdom wasn't passed down in the dynasty of Saul like it should have been. This guy's still upset. It's a political thing right here. Whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. And as he came, he cursed continually. And he threw stones at David and at all the servants of the king. David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right and on his left. They were parading trying to get out. And Shimei is kind of like up on a rise, cursing and throwing stuff at him. And Shimei said as he cursed, get out. Get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. Then Abishai, the son of Zariah, he's one of David's bodyguards, he said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and take off his head. That would fix it, right? That would shut this guy up. Let me just go cut his head off. I think I've got a lot of Abishai in me, you know? When somebody, who do they think they are rebuking me? I mean, who do they, I'm the king. Who do they think they are? They don't understand where I've been. They don't understand the duress. They don't understand. Who do they think they are? I want to take their head off. I want to take their head off. Maybe not literally, but I'm going to, I don't want to take their head off. Maybe. That's what Abishai. But the king said, David, the man after God's own heart, said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah? 
I mean, that this mindset that you've got, man, this is nothing. I don't want anything to do with this. If he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, curse David, then who shall say, why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite leave him alone and let him curse? For the Lord has told him to. Isn't this amazing? When someone comes against us, our friends, our friends hear about this, and what do they do? Oh, I can't believe they did this. Let me go take off their head. And they, they, they begin to, anyways, verbally, and we encourage that. Yes, that person was bad. Yes, we're there. But David, he, he recognized that God in his sovereignty is not just sovereign over our friends who sometimes like to multiply kisses. He's sovereign over every single relationship we have in our life. Every single one. And, and David recognizes that no one's rebuking him except by God. And so David knows, I need to listen to this guy. He's an enemy. I don't like the way he's saying it. I don't like the dirt and the, the bit hit with the rocks. Okay? I, don't like, I don't like the way he's, he's presenting this here. But maybe there's some truth. Maybe there's something in what he says that I need to hear. You know, our, our, our text, um, wounds of a friend. It's, it says that, that uh, wounds of a, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but uh, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Profuse means um, uh, abundant, a multitude of, plentiful. Now, let me, let me draw an observation on this, this text, okay? Because I, I think this is part of what Solomon's looking at. The, the, the uh, kisses of the enemy are a multitude, right? But the wounds of a friend are not. In other words, let me, just, let me mention this way. If you are in a, a situation, a circumstance, where a toxic relationship, where you're constantly, it's critical, where it's constant uh, de demeaning and uh, belittling and pejorative and, and, and negative, it's just constant, it's constant, it's constant. If you righteously can do so, you need to get out of that relationship, if you righteously can do so. Because that person needs to be rebuked, does not need to be rebuking. That is not what Solomon is saying here. Subject yourself to that needlessly. But what he is saying is we'll have a propensity, a tendency to shut that all down when that might not be. Second Chronicles 35, I just think this is fascinating. We can show it multiple places. Probably the best king in, in Jerusalem, other than King David, was a guy by the name of Josiah. Josiah. Now this is at the end of Josiah's reign. It says, after all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, after all this, you should check out those chapters. He just brings massive revival to Israel. After he prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, went up to fight at Carchemish on the Euphrates. Famous ancient battle. And Josiah went out to meet him. But, but he, that's Necho, sent envoys to him saying... What have we to do with each other, king of Judah? I'm not coming against you this day, but against the house with which I am at war. And God, it's interesting, he doesn't say Ra. He uses El. He, uses, he doesn't use God's covenant name. He's Nico, Pharaoh Nico's not in covenant relationship with God, but he uses El. God has commanded me to hurry. Cease opposing God, who is with me, lest he destroy you. Now, Carchemis is a pretty famous uh, ancient battle. Let me, this is the deal. And that's, it's, it just happened to be right on the plain of Megiddo. Maybe you've heard of this. The battle of Armageddon will be on the plain of Megiddo. And so Pharaoh Necho is coming through. Up here is Carchemish. What's going to happen at Carchemish? Assyrians, the, the old big guy on the block, being challenged by the new guy on the block, block the Babylonians. And the Assyrians have an alliance with the Egyptians. And so Necho and the Egyptian army is coming to help the Assyrians take on the Babylonians. Why does Josiah get in the way? That's a good question. We're not sure that's another whole sermon. But he gets in the way. And so Nicholas says, don't get out of my way. I have nothing against you. I need to get up there. I need to, to go take care of the Babylonians with the Assyrians. But, Nico, but, but Josiah doesn't. And so what's going to happen? Uh, well, let's look at the next slide. Nevertheless, Josiah did not turn away from him. Nevertheless but disguised himself in order to fight with him. 
He did not listen to the words of Nico from the mouth of God, but came to fight in the plain of Megiddo. He's going to get killed, literally. And then Nico is going to get up to Karchemish, but too late. The Syrians will already have been beat up. So he comes back down and he is very upset and takes it out on Jerusalem and on the people. And, and you, you wonder, Josiah, 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 don't you, you know that God can speak to you? You need more discernment. No question about it with the shimmy eyes, with, with the Pharaoh Nikos. You need more discernment. But God can speak to you if you listen to their rebuke. You can hear the voice of God. He, he didn't. He was, his life was, was all over afterwards. All right. now, but what Solomon's talking to his son about is, is his friends, right? So let's, just, let's look at this real briefly. Compare two folk. Because how do you not? No, we're practical. How do you not respond to rebuke? How should you not, right? Uh, king Saul, Israel's first king, has got a command. Go wipe out the Amalekites. This town of the Amalekites treated their children and treated their women and treated people who were vulnerable in ways we can't even talk about. Very, very, very evil and bad. And God said, I've given them time. You need to go wipe out them. What? Make such a total destruction that all their livestock, I want you to devote it to destruction. But Saul goes and sees some of the livestock and he kills the sickly livestock. But some of the livestock looks pretty doggone good. And he's thinking, <laughs> Whoa, this is... so he takes it. So, so Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel and behold, he set up a monument for himself. This gives you some insight into why we don't accept rebuke. Sets up a monument for himself. Turns and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And this is what comes to Gilgal. Samuel came to Saul and Saul said to him, Blessed be you, the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, Oh yeah? Then what is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears? And what is this lowing of the oxen that I hear? I thought that you were told you're supposed to kill it all. And I, but yet this lowing, what, what's going on? And Saul said, well, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have devoted to destruction. And Samuel's not hearing this. And Samuel keeps drilling on Saul and says, what do you mean? You disobeyed. Well, that doesn't. Saul says to Samuel... I have obeyed. It gets into denial when we're rebuked. Sometimes it's easy to go into denial, isn't it? What do you mean? There's nothing wrong with me. Oh, yeah? I have gone on the mission which the Lord sent me. I'm doing the best I can, but the people... Oh, it's not me, it's the people. See, they took the spoil and the sheep and the oxen and the best of the things devoted to destruction. I understand that the principle was, the command was, destroy everything. But it's the people, it's not me. It's other folk who did it. You're talking to the wrong person. We like to deflect. When we're rebuked. It's not me, man. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Next. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have trespassed the, trans, transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people. Finally, he says, yeah, 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 I know I blew it. I was afraid. Because all oh, these people, and I was thinking that if I, if I obeyed, they would all, just things would implode, and I didn't want that to happen. And so I just, I just wanted to appease the people, and you can understand, can you? Maybe Samuel could, but God could not. And this is where Samuel comes down and says, to, to obey is better than sacrifice. And so, so Saul says to him, I have sinned, yet Honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God. You see what he's saying? Okay, okay, yeah, I blew it. I blew it. Guilty as charged. Can we not tell anyone about this? Can, can we just not say anything? I mean, everyone blows it, right? I mean, we don't need to say. This is, this is why we reject rebuke. Because we want to be honored before people. We want, even the person rebuking us, we want to be big in his eyes. We want to set up monuments for ourselves. This is our issue. This was Saul's issue. But, but David, when he was rebuked by a friend, you know, most famous chapter, one of the most famous chapters in the Bible, 2 Samuel 11, uh, David and Bathsheba, you know the story. David sees Bathsheba. And the problem is Bathsheba is married to one of his good friends, but he has an affair with her while his good friend is off at war. Bathsheba becomes pregnant. David's not sure what to do. He has his good friend, Bathsheba's husband, killed. 
so he can marry Bathsheba. He thinks he gets away with this thing. Whew, cost me more than I wanted to, but I'm okay. It's, it's, it's all right. Nine months later, nine months later, you got 2 Samuel 12, David and Nathan. And, and you, you know, think about this for a second. The king, the king is about to get rebuked by a prophet. If you would read 2 Chronicles, there are lots of stories of prophets rebuking kings. None of them go well for the prophet. None of them work out well for the prophet. It's a bad situation all over the place. Uh, maybe he's thinking of when Samuel tried to rebuke Saul. It just isn't going to work. So he tries to get creative, and you know the story. He says, David, David, we got, we got a problem in your, in, your, in your empire, in your kingdom. And David says, well, lay it on me. He says, okay, you got this guy over here. He's a, he's a poor guy. He's faithful to you. He's a loyal guy, you know, uh, but doesn't have dirt. Uh, so saved all of his money, he buys one little lamb. But the lamb, according to Nathan, is not just a, a lamb. It's not even just a pet. It's a daughter to him. And they cuddle it. His kids cuddle it. And they're always holding this lamb. And the lamb eats with them. And they eat dinner. The lamb comes and jumps. And they eat together. And, and he just loves his lamb. He says, now his next door neighbor is this guy that's got all kinds of herds. All kinds of herds. And he's got this next door neighbor. has got all kinds of herds. He has a friend come visit him. And he knows that he's supposed to, you know... Uh, present dinner for his... But he doesn't want to lose one of his own sheep. So what he does is when the poor guy's not looking, he sneaks over there and he, he steals the poor guy's one lamb who's like a daughter to him, and he slaughters it. And then he cooks it, and, and he gives it to his friend. I don't know what to do. And you can, David kind of freaks. And David swears by God. This is pretty serious. That man deserves to die. He shall give back fourfold, which is what the law required. He, should, he, he deserves to die. After he calms down a little bit, Nathan looks at him. Very famous line in scripture. Nathan says, you are the man. And so it's like, it's like Debbie in the hallway's the tunnels of Moody, it's like, he realizes. And Nathan goes on and says, David, for crying out loud, you're the king. You have everything. You got a harem. You have it all. And what do you do? You take from one of your best friends? Is this what you, what are you doing? This David, you have got a, a pride problem. And you've got a power problem. And it's messing up your family. And it's messing up the people of Israel. And you've got this secrecy problem where you hide sin. And you, you don't tell anyone about it. You've got these issues and your reputation. You think the people in, the, in the, the, the palace don't know? They all know. Matter of fact, David, you need to understand that your actions have brought contempt on our people by the enemies of God. In other words, the enemy, our enemies know what you've done. And you were supposed to represent God. And you've messed up his reputation. I just hope you know what your reputation is, David. And then walks away. This is what David. Now remember all the words that Saul said when he was rebuked? It's the only thing David says. I have sinned. As Saul had said that, but... David adds three words that change everything. Against the Lord. I, notice, no, no excuse making. No, well, it's Bathsheba's fault. I mean, listen, I'm just hanging out at my palace and, my, my, and, and she's there right next to my, and she's naked. And we went for crying out loud. And I'm going through a midlife crisis. I mean, a lot of guys in my, what can you, everyone should do. I mean, it's not my fault. It doesn't go down that road. I have sinned. Against the Lord. He's going to write about this. Now he could have just kept it quiet. But he, he writes a psalm about this. That is going to be presented to the entire nation. That we know today. It's in Psalm 51. But look at what he says. Against you, you only have I sinned. Now did he sin against Bathsheba? Absolutely. And Uriah, of course he had him killed. And the servants, now they're all gossiping. And, and his nation, yes. Because there's going to be all kinds of issues happening in his family. And in that part of the world, because of this, he sinned against them all. But against you, you ultimately. Against you, you primarily. I have sinned. I've blown it. I've blown it. He embraces the rebuke. He listens to the rebuke. He would go on to write some, some psalms for us. 
He would go on to be man, God's man after God's own heart. He would go on to lead Israel in equity, to bring the, the, the ark in, to, to rebuild the, the, or to set up things, to build the temple. He would have lost all of that. None of that would have happened if he would not have listened to rebuke. I think that he's thinking about this very instance. Down the road, he writes Psalm 141. He says this, let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil for my head. You know, the, the, the culture, you know, no one was taking showers, right? And so everybody, sm- you know, you got that. So you get all these people together, and it smells, but they're all used to this, so they're okay. So what you would do, though, when someone came into your house, you didn't do this for everybody, but when someone came in that you really wanted to honor, you took a vial of oil mixed with perfume, and you poured it on their head, and so filled the home with this beautiful smell. And the word was that, that as beautiful as this is, that's how I think about this person. This person I want, Mary does this to Jesus, right? That, that this person I honor so much, I respect and love so much that I do this. Do you see what he's saying here? He's saying, he's saying rebuke from a friend. Some people are going to reject it. Some people hate it. Some people don't. For me... I view it as the greatest honor that could come my way. Then I love this last line. Let my head not refuse it. God's going to uh, send us Nathans. By the way, Nathan's name means gift from God. If God hasn't sent you in a Nathan in a while, please, you just got to know this. It's probably not because you've arrived, right? I'm guessing that that's probably not the issue. He probably, you probably haven't gotten a Nathan because it's a gift from God and he knows how you'll treat the gift. You probably you haven't gotten a Nathan because, because he knows how you're going to respond. Maybe you've already communicated one way or the other to everybody else that don't you dare rebuke me or it will be a war. Don't you even start coming after me or I will start pointing out all the stuff in you as well. Don't you even, because you're, you're going you're gonna to regret it. Maybe you've communicated that in the past. God has been gracious in sending you Nathan's gifts. Sometimes they look like Shimei. Sometimes they look like Pharaoh Nico. But, but gifts to move you. But you've rejected them. And so here's, here's the deal. We've all... Well, Here's the deal. Would you be open, willing to pray this prayer? God, would you send me a Nathan? I, I, I recognize that, that, that he's a gift from you. And at that time when it comes, I may not see. I just need your spirit to help me see it. And I promise you, I'll treat your gifts nice. And I promise you, if you do, my head won't refuse. My ears will not refuse the message he has for me. Would you be willing to pray that? It's a tough prayer. Because we want, we want that fan club. We don't want a friend club. We want to grow, but only to an extent. What the Holy Spirit will show me from the Holy Spirit is cool. What the Holy Spirit wants to show me from other people, I don't know if I'm into. Uh, but that's his tool, the community. And so I want to invite you to, to pray with me now. Even Would you close your eyes, bow your heads? And just between you and God. So you don't have to do this if this is not your heart. But if it is your heart, would you be willing to pray right now, Lord, would you send me a Nathan? And if you do, I'll treat your gift nice. And if you do, I will hear the message he has for me. God, I thank you for your commitment to to us to rebuke us with your word, to rebuke us from other people. And Lord, even as I sit up here to preach, you know how often I have shut down the Nathans that you sent me. Or at least in my heart I have. But I pray for myself and I pray for my brothers and sisters here. God, would you give us ears to hear? Our desire is to know you better. It's to grow. And uh, Lord, if the way you want to teach us is to put your finger on those things through other people, 
We won't refuse it. I would ask that that would be so. And even as we take up an offering now, God, would it be used to blow away the message of the souls in this world that we have to protect ourselves, that there's somebody that a little bit bigger than us, you, and that your love for us, your love for the world, uh, sits free. I pray, Lord, that... Uh, Offering taken this morning would be used to get that message across here, Erie, in this world. In the name of Jesus, amen.